Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the invitation to come here. I'm going to add to some of what David's already said, but also delve deeper in terms of the UK as a body and look at, come and look at Northern Ireland. But in terms of my own background, I sort of began life as a student, sort of intrigued about this project that was European integration. Where did it come from? More importantly, what did it actually look like? How would it actually operate in terms of governance structures, in terms of what competences would this, would this thing, this, this political system, be actually given? So I was intrigued by all of this, moved into this. My sort of background is in looking at European public policy, and especially the whole area of, of antitrust. But in more recent times, and with the debates here, particularly post-devolution in Northern Ireland, then to begin to come back and look at what does the EU actually mean for Northern Ireland? Where are the way, how does Northern Ireland as a region, as a political system, how does it actually integrate? Is it proactive, reactive? How does it play the European game in all of this? Now we're at a stage in terms of the referendum, which is due in just over four weeks' time. This probably is the biggest decision in terms of my electoral lifetime, but where the UK may actually end up. A month from now, what actually happens if Article 50 is actually enacted? But it's also important to say that actually, even if the UK votes to remain, there are still issues to, for the UK to think about in terms of where it is in terms of the European integration process. I initially began, maybe rather naively, thinking a referendum was a good idea. I still think it's a good idea. We can debate the ideas of democracy uh, a, a little bit later. But referenda always have one major problem, and that is, in many ways, they may begin very quickly to spin out of control. So if I take you back to David's slides in terms of Cameron's four baskets, have we heard much about them in the last three, four, five weeks? They've almost seemed to disappear. We've got both the Leave campaign and the Remain campaign coming in, and stories are bad if you, you know, if, 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 if we if we leave, we can stop the, the idea of Turkish immigration. Well, there are either movement, free movement of Turks, which again covered practically every single Sunday newspaper. Uh, you'll see at the weekend. Uh, you'll see today in terms of, well, sorry, last week, Cameron talked about the idea if, if we were to leave, does this threaten peace, stability? Again, today, there's something about cancer. Your, your chance of getting cancer care will be worse if we actually leave. And I think what we're getting here in all of this is a project fear on one side, a project fantasy on the other side. And I think, what are we missing here? Are you all ready? Is the electorate actually in this part of the world? Are we ready to go out and actually vote? And what do we actually, what are the issues here? And part of me thinks a referendum is a really good idea because I think one of the problems about this is about connecting. Do we connect to this European Union? What is it doing? And I think one of the failures, certainly of governments at national level, be they whatever, be they Labour, be they Conservative, be the Conservative Liberal Democrat Coalition, is they have never tried to actually explain what the EU actually is to that wider audience. What is the EU? The EU essentially is, produced, is the product of a series of treaties. Why have these treaties come about? Why have national governments actually signed those treaties? What is actually in them? Um, is it about losing sovereignty, we often hear? Yes, it is. That's the bottom line. But in what areas has this actually happened? And why has it actually happened? I think it's the why, the where and why, are really important in all of this. In terms of factual information, I think it is one of those things that is really missing in terms of the debate has moved on, it's moved beyond Cameron's four baskets, it's moved into these sort of scare stories on both sides, and are we actually presented with real hard facts? Can we identify hard facts about the nature of the European integration process? I'm not going to go through all of the issues, but I will say on passing, I sort of laid some blame in terms of the UK governments, but they're not the only ones to bear some responsibility. Maybe academia has in terms of maybe they should be getting out and doing more. But another one to think about and debate is the whole role of the media. To what extent has the media actually begun to explain what it is? If you listen to some of the issues about the European Union, what actually is the EU? We hear this term banded around about EU, but essentially, do we begin to break it up in terms of the core institutions? Is it the idea that it's the Commission, this undemocratically elected body making all the decisions? It's certainly powerful. There's no doubt about that. But if we're going to talk about the Commission, we need to bring into play the Council and the European Parliament. Because there's been a drift, really, over the last 20 odd years about member states were always the core uh, anchor in the system, but essentially, over the last 20 years, those member states have become more powerful. The Commission, again, its role of initiative has certainly over time has actually decreased, certainly under the Juncker Commission. 
they're doing. They're deliberately doing less. There's less regulation coming through, less proposals leading to regulation coming through. And where we think about the EU, when we hear about the EU, think about where is the Council? Where is the European Parliament in all of this? Because the European Parliament, again, is now this co-legislator in over 80% of the legislation. So it's a key actor. But do we hear about all of this and how it actually all shapes up and plays out? What a referendum, I think, where there are so many issues coming into play. How do we begin to work out which bits we may like, which we may dislike? How do we make that final decision? The referendum itself plays out very differently across the UK. There are so, some common themes. But there are also themes for regions to, and nations within the UK to begin to think about. Of course, I'm going to move to Northern Ireland and mention Scotland and Wales in passing. But we also need to stop and think here about England as well. And do we divide England up into different sort of groups in terms of how they're seeing the whole idea and the whole debate? And this leads into public opinion. Public opinion, and there's been loads of opinion polls the last two or three years about public opinion, attitudes towards, is it remain, is it leave? You've seen these now on a pretty several times, weekly basis, if not more. The first thing to notice about many of those polls have not included Northern Ireland. So we haven't been quite sure. There's been the odd one. It's really only since about the last year, beginning with the Danske Bank, then following by Lusatalk, then following by various consultancies, we begin to get a clear idea about what Northern Ireland may think about the European integration project. But in terms of England, while I'm actually here, what we've also seen in recent years is the rise, I'm not going to describe it as nationalism, but English regionalism coming into play that actually is working its way out uh, and uh, what might happen post-Brexit. And of course, the most, in terms of which is the region of the UK that actually looks more like there's a strong support for staying in, it happens to be London. And there are issues here about what might happen if the UK stays, what would happen if the UK actually stays in terms of the London perspective and all of this, but we'll leave, we'll park that for now. In Northern Ireland, it is clear that a majority, just slightly, 54%, is in favour of the UK remaining in the European Union. That puts it behind Scotland, which is still hovering between 60 to 65% of those who vote to remain in. England as a whole, again, is looking, gearing just slightly towards the, the leave, as is Wales. But come back to Northern Ireland and then think about, can we break that 54% down? We can, and there are some issues that we need to think about. One might be, who are those that are saying they would like to leave the European Union? And this really identifies a section of society that actually reflects a wider section of society across the European continent. As I give this talk this afternoon, we're thinking about recent events in Austria. And strangely enough, some of those key core characteristics come out who voted for the FPO, or who are the more people likely to leave the European Union? They tend to be, and this leads us back to this issue about connections again. Do we connect? How do we connect with the European Union? Are there better ways to do it? It tends to be people who, in general, tend to be older, post-45, tends to be males, tends to be people who have not gone through university education, tend to be in sort of blue collar, manual collar, or unfortunately unemployed. And these issues, they're people, what is the EU? What does it actually do? So that's one factor coming in, but how do we connect? Does the EU do anything of benefit? Well, we can quibble that. It doesn't do everything wonderfully. There's things we can home in on. But maybe there's some things that can do better, gives us advantages as, as citizens. Roaming charges, in terms of competition policy, antitrust is, 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 is one, maybe one example. But part that aside again, there's another characteristic about the polls for Northern Ireland. And this is interesting if we go back to the ref only referendum on this issue before in 1975, and there's a split in terms of the two main communities. And it's quite a stark split. In terms of particularly the nationalist community, a polls will show you those in favour of remaining are hovering between, moving, depending on whether you include in many ways those who haven't made up their mind, but more likely to, 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 to vote to remain, between 75 and 93, 94%. On the unionist side, of it, uh, it is 20%. So there are issues here. How does this play out? Now, we will go through the various hypotheticals. We can take those in questions afterwards. Is this an issue we should be, should be thinking of? But what is the EU? What does the EU actually mean for Northern Ireland? We come back to some of the key issues. And I won't go through all of these in, in any great depth at all, but just to mention some of them to think about. One of them, I guess, we begin with the budget. 
A lot is made about the EU budget, where the money goes, what the actual size of that EU budget actually, or the UK composition or contribution to the budget actually is. Where does the money go? Is it 18 billion? Is it down to 8 billion? We take off various receipts. That begins to come into play again in terms of what does it eat? Because you're thinking about what does the UK actually get? What does it get for its money? Is it, and the bottom line here is it's a net contributor. It puts more money in than it actually gets out. But we need to think, well, what is the advantage then of the UK actually staying? Can we begin to think of certain areas? The one theme that hangs over, because the debate in terms of the EU referendum, as I said, plays out differently across the UK. The one thing that makes Northern Ireland very different from the Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland is the border. It's that border that then begins to impact or has a, has a role in all of the areas I'm now going to, to mention, or most of them. I'm not going to talk about borders or the nature of those borders and identity. Uh, that'll be followed up by, by my colleague. But I will say, and echoing another point in terms of the nature of that border, again, it's not a bilateral arrangement, back to a point that David made, it's, a, it's, it's an arrangement with the other 27 member states, or 26 plus islands. So how does all of that play out? In all of this, there's this idea, well, is it not linked back to the economy? Again, there's numerous reports coming out here about the pros, the cons of Northern Ireland being in or being outside, what that does to trade flows, what does that do to, to manufacturing exports, because again, Northern Ireland exports uh, more to the EU than it does in, in terms of, the, until we break it down in terms of GB. But again, most of those are heading south, so does that begin to impact on some of those issues? There are issues here about foreign direct investment, so if, you know, in terms of, does it, are we stronger, weaker, inside or outside? But you've got to make your minds up about that in terms of what you're actually hearing and all uh, in, in the debate. In terms of foreign direct investment, again, there are signs that while we're waiting for the UK to negotiate, if the UK were to leave, what does that mean that firms might, they may still invest, but do they invest as much? Question to, to debate. The other big issue in terms of Northern Ireland, again, and it plays out differently because it's more important in this part of the world than in, 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 the, in the GB, or in the UK in general, is agriculture. Um, how important, we would have made our minds up here, how important is agriculture in this part of the world in terms of employment? Is it directly in the agricultural sector? Is it in the agri-food business? What do firms actually think involved in, in, in those issues about membership uh, or not? Is there, for example, and again, it's all about do we have the status quo, and that's what I should have said earlier, do we, have the do we know enough about the status quo, the way the EU operates now, or do we move to a new, new situation? A new situation could be better, but do we know it? Do we, actually, do we need to debate this and say what it would actually look like? So, for example, in terms of we can have our views on the common agriculture policy, uh, personally, not one of my favourite favorite areas, but we can say in terms of is there an alternative? Is there a better alternative to what a British agricultural policy might look like outside the European Union? There could very well be. Or do we still need to worry about the actual, or, or is it beneficial in terms of the money that comes from the CAP to the farming community here? Things to, to debate. Um, what is the purpose of, importance of agriculture? Do we link it into wider trade negotiations? Uh, might we be better outside? These are, it says when you begin to break this sort of idea of an EU referendum and issues at stake, it becomes much, much more vast uh, than we initially might, might think. Another one, also important, maybe, but obviously arguably less so, is fisheries. I mean, the idea, what is common fisheries policy? What's the purpose of, common, of the common fisheries policy? Do we need it? Are we better out, outside uh, the, the system? Again, if I'm standing here, one of the issues to think about in terms of the universities, and again, what is important for them in this part of the world is there's, there's the finance streams coming through Horizon 2020, the various framework programs. But actually, you know what, it's not so much about the money. A lot of what the EU does, what it allows, people might argue, is cooperation. Is that part of what we need to think about in terms of where the universities sit and the opportunities for wider cooperation? Or can the universities just link in? It doesn't need the, those EU dynamics. It can get money from elsewhere rather than drawing it through various streams. Won't talk about picking this up later, but other funding streams coming through, be the structural funds, be the, be the peace funds, we can work out, well, actually, we could be, do we need them? No, we could arrange some negotiation between Britain and Ireland in terms of the peace monies coming into play. Immigration is another key thing we could, we could discuss, but I'll also move on to the politics of all of this. What is the 
interests of this part of the world with the EU? What are the priorities? In terms of those negotiations, was this part of the world involved in Cameron's negotiation? Did they try to get involved? Um, more importantly, if we ever in the situation of it was a vote to leave, how do we then get involved, or who gets involved in negotiations about what a Brexit may actually look like? And other things to actually debate, which then takes you back to, we need to weigh up what the pros and cons of each of these policy areas might actually be. There's another interesting thing, uh, hypothetical about all of this, in terms of links back to devolution. And this is where the lawyer is probably a bit of more of a greater insight. But in terms of powers devolved to the delegated the past, shared to the European Union dimension, but then also, of course, in terms of the various devolution settlements, then also delegated to the regions. What happens if the UK actually leaves? Are there issues about where do those policy responsibilities fall? Do they come back to the region levels? Might we suddenly find ourselves involved, more centrally involved, in common agriculture policy, what it might, what it might look like? The debate about Northern Ireland's membership, and I say this will all be familiar to you, so I'm not going to through any of this in many ways, but what do, as a society, are we prepared for this actual vote? What are the issues we need to, to think about in all of this? And on this particular slide again, we've got the UK government in terms of how it's interacting, in terms of how it interacted in terms of the, it's, the baskets, but also in terms of where it might be. And again, I stress here, not only if the UK were to leave, but the UK still remains in the European Union. It's an issue for the UK government no matter what. And the question is then, what would the situation after the 24th of June actually look like? And how does this part of the world then begin to engage in, in, in all of that? But again, these are the issues we need to, I think, debate. And we can pick these up maybe in the Q&A in terms of the nature of that land border. I haven't talked about the common travel area. We can come back to that. What is the political impact of all of this in terms of the institutions of devolution themselves, the mechanisms, the way they work? Are there issues of security coming into play? Peace process, question mark. Is there the capacity to deliver? Do we need to reinvest? And then the economic impact. And then the whole idea about preferred borders. But as I say, lots of questions there. We've got to try and work our way through. But I will leave that there for now and then pick up some of those then afterwards. Thank you.